Well, thank you for your kind introduction. <clears throat> it's an enormous pleasure to be here and to speak with all of you. These opportunities are, are wonderful. I think they're as inspiring and um, provide this, the same degree of learning opportunities for the speakers as they do for people in the audience. We have um, a situation where we're trying to treat a very rare disease. And um, even though for me it's a very common thing because that's what I do all day, in the world it's actually pretty uncommon. And um, there are four or five, six, seven Americans and 100,000 who develop this disease. And in many sites like the pancreas, it's only a three in a million. And some sites it's one in a million, some sites it's less than a million, one in a million. So with this type of a tumor, it really helps when people are able to get together, meet other patients, and meet um, faculties from uh, different places who specialize in this type of disease. The other thing I just want to tell you is that what used to be a very rare disease in the country is becoming much, much more common. Not only is the incidence increased by 500% for various reasons, but the prevalence is enormously increased. The prevalence meaning how many people in the United States per 100,000 Americans, or per million Americans. The prevalence has now increased that it's second among gastrointestinal cancers only to colon cancer. There are roughly a million Americans with colon cancer and 100,000 with neuroendocrine cancer. That's more than the number of Americans with stomach cancer plus pancreas cancer added together which is phenomenal because everybody knows about pancreas cancer and stomach cancer, but they don't think about neuroendocrine cancer. So neuroendocrine cancer is the type of cancer that Steve Jobs had and um, many, many uh, people in the news have, sometimes uh, misrepresented as being pancreas cancer or intestinal cancer, but really it's neuroendocrine. So anyway, let's jump in and talk about uh, the situation. Um, first of all, I'm gonna be focusing on treatment using medications, treating the body, and coordinating treatments of different kinds. Each of the people that are in this little circle here are specialists who all provide very critical aspects of care. At Mount Sinai, we get together every single week for a neuroendocrine tour board. And these different specialties are represented, and we can look at the pathology and radiology and, and discuss the patient management with a whole multidisciplinary team everybody providing input. Just think of the neuroendocrine patient in the middle as the zebra in the middle of the room, better than thinking of it as an elephant in the middle of the room, and all of these people are contributing. If you remember the story of the uh, 10 blind men and the elephant in India, um, wise philosophers all trying to figure out the nature of an elephant when they were all blind and they were just feeling a different part, and one thought oh, a leg was a tree trunk and one thought a tail was a snake and so on. Nobody could figure out what an elephant was until they all sat down and talked to each other in the same room. So it's not an elephant, it's a zebra, but we all have to sit down and talk to each other. So it, w it makes a big difference trying to decide should a patient have surgery first, should a patient have treatment of hormonal problems first, should a patient have um, systemic treatments first, what should we do, when should a patient have certain types of nuclear medicine procedures. This is the way to make those decisions in the best way when we have experts talking to each other. Okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about how we go about treating neuroendocrine cancers, let you know what's out there, and give you some information about how we take this information and synthesize it into a comprehensible idea of how we make treatment decisions for individual patients recognizing that everybody who has this cancer is a unique individual and nothing is um, harder to uh, treat from doctors' points of view than patients who have rare diseases. Where It's not just look it up in a textbook or Google and you'll see exactly what to do. It's not like that when you're dealing with a rare tumor and there aren't as many really um, good sources of information. So I'll share with you what's out there. I'm gonna talk about targets on the cancer cells that are used for therapy because that is the way we think about treatments in oncology. We want to attra attack the cancer cells in such a way we can kill cancer cells without killing normal cells. We want to look for special features on the membranes of cancer cells or inside cancer cells that allow us to direct therapy. So the first molecular target on neuroendocrine cells to talk about is the somatostatin receptor. Somatostatin is a natural hormone in the body it binds to a somatostatin receptor, which is on the membrane of certain cells. 
And fortunately for those of us here, 80 to 90% of neuroendocrine tumors have somatostatin receptors. And this means that 80 to 90% of patients can be treated with treatments that are directed at the somatostatin receptor. Natural somatostatin binds very well to the receptor, and so do, does its analogs. And then after binding to the receptor, it internalizes inside the cell and gets stuck inside the cell where it exerts its actions. That's very important to remember. It doesn't just stick to the cell, it actually goes inside the cell. Somatostatin will stop the cell from dividing. And somatostatin analogs can be used often for years in controlling the division of neuroendocrine cells and keeping it under control. It also reduces the secretion of hormones by neuroendocrine cells. It's really very valuable. And of the somatostatin analogs, we use most commonly lanreotide and octreotide, although there are other ones. These are very similar to the one that you see on the left, which is human somatostatin. The ones we call analogs are slightly modified, but the so-called binding site, the things that are yellow that stick to the cell are very, very similar. Just a slight modification of one amino acid to make it more stable. This is a slide from Dr. Marianne Pavel. I think very nicely shows how remarkably safe these drugs are. These are the potential side effects of sandostatin, and you'll see the top uh, bunch relate to the gastrointestinal tract, and then there's a, a smaller percentage of people who have things like elevated blood sugar or slowing of the heart rate. The items on the top are almost always due to a deficiency of pancreatic digestive enzymes, because one of the side effects of somatostatin analogs like octreotide or lanreotide is it stops the production of digestive enzymes by the pancreas. As a result, undigested food goes all the way to the colon without being digested, and bacteria in the colon will ferment it and make lots of gas. So a lot of people who complain of diarrhea, fatty bowel movements, floating bowel movements, greasy bowel movements, urgent bowel movements, all this kind of bowel movement stuff, it's related to not having enough pancreatic enzymes. And once you recognize this, it's easily treated by a nutritional supplement called pancreatic enzymes, usually given as a prescription, common brands being Creon and Zenpep, and it will usually make these symptoms go away. Injection site pain is a problem more with octreotide than lanreotide, but it is something that um, happens once in a while when you have shots in the behind. Okay, gallstones can happen when you have somatostatin analogs in about 50% of people. However, we encourage surgeons to always take out a gallbladder when they're doing surgery for metastatic neuroendocrine tumors to prevent this complication. However, if you still have a gallbladder and you're on somatostatin analogs, don't worry about it, just leave your gallbladder alone. And if you need to have it taken out one day, it usually can be done with a laparoscope and can be done later on. You don't take it out just for fun. But if you're in there anyway, doing surgery on the liver, doing surgery on the abdomen, it doesn't really add much to the complications of surgery to take the gallbladder and put it in a bottle. Octreotide has been around for a pretty long time. It's a very important drug, approved in the United States for controlling both flushing and diarrhea from carcinoid syndrome. And it dramatically improves these things after a little washout period in the uh, graphs um, below, if you can see. There's um, then a, a treatment period. The amount of flushing goes way down. The amount of diarrhea goes way down. And the production of 5-HIAA, which reflects serotonin production by the tumor, is reduced by about 50%. So it really does have a good effect. The first really major study that proved the anti-cancer effects of the somatostatin analogs is known as Clarinet. There was a small German study done earlier known as PROMID that suggested there was also an anti-cancer effect with um, octreotide. However, that was a small study that was closed early and was not accepted by the FDA for approval. So this led to the Clarinet trial, a randomized trial of lanreotide versus placebo that was designed at a time before we had other treatments for uh, neuroendocrine tumors, so that it was felt to be an ethical uh, randomization and the people who got placebo then received active lanreotide if the cancer ever grew while they were taking their placebo. A dramatic difference between the two, this is the paper we published in the New England Journal of Medicine showing the top line of people who got lanreotide, bottom line people who got no lanreotide. With no lanreotide, the average time until there was a major progression of cancer was 18 months. In the people who got lanreotide, most people still were doing fine and it never progressed. 
I gave the latest update on this paper at ASCO cancer meeting last year. It, for people with intestinal neuroendocrine tumors, 61 and a half months average cancer control just with Lanria tide alone. It's remarkable. And that means half the patients were controlled a lot longer than that, some people more than 10 years. The people that got uh, no Lanria tide, as you see, 18 months, so it's a huge difference in the overall population that including pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, other neuroendocrine tumors, the average control time was about 38 and a half months, still a long period of cancer control, and we've seen individuals who have been on it literally for decades. A study was also done uh, recently using landreotide as a treatment for carcinoid syndrome, which we'll be talking about later, to stop symptoms of um, flushing and diarrhea that can happen from carcinoid. And it turns out that it's a very effective drug for treating carcinoid syndrome symptoms and was approved for that purpose. Also, a study done showing the effect of landreotide on symptoms that patients were having. Um, this is in addition to controlling the cancer, stool urgency, leakage of bowel movements, incontinence, pain with bowel movements dramatically reduced by lanreotide. So we have two drugs now for controlling the symptoms uh, using somatostatin analogs. One is octreotide, one is lanreotide. And we'll be talking about other treatments a little later. But right now, while we're focused on the somatostatin receptor on cancer cells, let's go to the next generation of things targeting the somatostatin receptor. One of the really exciting things that was alluded to earlier today, and you'll be hearing a whole lot more later today by Dr. Lisa Bodai, who's gonna talk about exciting new developments in so-called peptide receptor radiotherapy using the somatostatin analog targeting, or using somatostatin receptor targeting, I should say, of um, neuroendocrine tumors. Um, the one that got approved is called Lutathera, Lutetium-177 dotatate, dotaoctreotate. It's injected intravenously, it sticks to the cancer cells, it goes inside the cells, it sends out a little radioactive um, radiation called a beta particle. It travels two millimeters, which is very, very little. It's about maybe an eighth of an inch, and that's all the collateral damage that is possible from this. If you have a tumor, you have just this teeny rim of normal tissue that gets radiated, and the rest of the body doesn't get radiated to the same degree, and it has a, it's very effective in treating cancer. This is a study from the sort of a cartoon that was made by Dr. Helmut Mackey in Germany. It's a nice picture to see what goes on when you see the word target. That refers to um, the somatostatin receptor on the cell. The thing they call ligand is the somatostatin analog linked to a chelating agent. And inside the chelating agent, we put in an imaging agent, commonly used as gallium-68. Okay, and commonly used for therapy is lutetium-177. Exactly the same molecule, just a different isotope. And you can use it for imaging, and you can use it for therapy. And um, you'll hear a lot more about this later. Dr. Lali Kostikoglu is going to be speaking in detail about gallium-68 dotatate imaging and molecular imaging of neuroendocrine tumors. So I'm just giving you just a little uh, brief introduction so we can understand um, more about how it relates to medical ecology. We most commonly use lutetium-177 as our um, radioactive material because the uh, penetration is only two millimeters, as I said, which is very, very short. Yttrium-90 has been used and is effective as well, but the um, beta particles, electrons that come from yttrium-90 travel 12 millimeters instead of two millimeters, so there's a little more collateral damage, and more risk potentially to the kidneys and bone marrow. The European experience that led to uh, what we have now and uh, was really uh, remarkable that most patients were able to have control of their disease. The average time of control looked like it was about 40 months. And if you took patients who didn't have a creatinine level higher than 1.7 or creatinine clearance that wasn't more than 50 uh, percent, wasn't less than 50 percent, and you used amino acid infusions and hydration, people did very well without their kidneys failing and getting um, serious bone marrow disease that can lead to leukemia, uh, for example, or kidney failure, or serious liver injury was very, very rare. In the, um, we'll talk about toxicities later, but generally 
it's quite well tolerated. There can be nausea that needs to be treated with nausea medicines, increasing abdominal pain from inflammation associated with the tumor. And sometimes you could release lots of hormones causing a hormone-related crisis like a carcinoid crisis, which we try to prevent and treat if it happens. This is an example of somebody who had an exceptionally good response. This doesn't happen to everybody, but this is a patient of Dr. Quackaboom who was treated with lutetium-177. Dota talk he was using at the time. And these dark things that you see in the liver are all tumors in this slice scan. And you can see the tumors are just melted away and there's only a small fraction of what there was. In some people it's, it's stable, some people it shrinks, but um, it's nice when it um, goes away. To um, finally nail this down and prove the effectiveness and get the drug approved in the United States and Europe, a big randomized trial was done that, I was a part of here called NETR1. This was a randomized trial in people who had intestinal carcinoid tumors resistant to octreotide 30 milligrams IM every month. They were getting standard dose of octreotide and the cancer grew anyway. The radiology was reviewed by a central radiologist to confirm the progression was real and significant. <clears throat> These patients were then randomized to one of two treatments. One treatment was to double the dose of octreotide, something pretty commonly done. You go from 30 milligrams every month to 60 milligrams every month. That means two injections, one on each side, which is a fairly big pain in the butt. But the question is whether that would result in better cancer control than 30 milligrams, or whether it's better to use the radioactive stuff. One injection every eight weeks for four times total, and then maintenance with the same conventional octreotide 30 milligrams. This was published in the New England Journal, led pretty rapidly to FDA approval, and here's what happened. 4% of patients getting the lutetium dotatate had progression of cancer, and everybody else really had control. The shrinkage in a major way happened in 19%. Uh, most of the other patients, it was either stable or mild shrinkage and progression, only in 4%, and the average time to progression hasn't been reached yet, but it's estimated that it'll be probably the same as the people um, we're reporting from Europe at around 40 months or so, but we don't have any numbers yet. Dr. Bodine may have some updated information for us. The people who got the double dose of octreotide, which is the thing oncologists have been doing for years, was not very effective at all. Within a period of 8.4 months, most of the patients had already had progression of cancer. So it did not provide any significant benefit. The main benefit of using super large doses of somatostatin analogs is probably for treating refractory symptoms. It's one of the things that could be done for carcinoid syndrome along with other medications that we'll be talking about and also removing bulk of cancer, which is making the um, uh, serotonin. Survival looks like it's better with PRRT. Looks like it's significantly better, but patients haven't been followed enough, long enough to prove the, um, that this data will hold up. We think it probably will. The other thing that was just reported this past year was a study that we did on quality of life in patient with NETR1 that not only does it control cancer and keep it from growing, but it makes people feel better. The majority of patients had control of diarrhea, control of flushing, control of tumor-related pain, like liver pain and bone pain, increase in energy level, increase in general level of performance and activity, and improvement in um, health score by standardized tests of uh, quality of life that patients would fill out in questionnaires. So by all of these types of criteria, patients did better when they had PRT. This is assuming you're somebody who needs PRT and it's an appropriate treatment, you, every treatment has its particular time and place. I'm showing you this um, to give you some idea of the kinds of patients who might be appropriate for PRRT, but Dr. Bodai will talk about this in a lot more detail. But the most important thing is that you have positive imaging, which nowadays is usually gallium-68 dotatate PET or um, a similar somatostatin imaging, and your cancer is not being controlled with normal doses of somatostatin analogs. Those are the most important criteria. The official approval is for uh, neuroendocrine tumors that started in the gastrointestinal tract and pancreas. And it's sort of a case-by-case -case, um, problem trying to figure out how to get approval when it started at other sites. Although normally if somebody needs it, we're usually able to figure out a way to make it happen. Serious side effects are uncommon, as I mentioned. 
the most common side effect being uh, nausea from amino acids that are used. And there's some new ways of uh, dealing with that that we'll be talking about. Kidney protection is very important, as I mentioned, because you could end up in renal failure and end up on dialysis. If you start with renal failure when you go in, it can make it worse. If you start with normal kidney function, most people do just fine, and there's hardly a change in kidney function. So just um, the last thing I'm going to say about this uh, in the formal presentation, except how we're going to use it in conjunction with other therapies, and I'll leave the rest to Dr. Bodai. Altogether, a total of four injections of lutathera. If you look in the literature and they talk about a dose of 7.4 gigabecquerels, that's the way they talk about it in Europe. In the United States, we call it 200 millicuries. It's the same dose. So all the American studies and European studies are done with a similar dose. It's normally given every eight weeks, but if people need to delay it by a month or two or whatever, that can be done on a case-by-case -case basis. The dose could be reduced depending on various circumstances. And uh, patients have to have careful instruction and radiation safety and um, stay in the facility where they're being treated long enough to get intravenous amino acids, fluids, and um, follow-up. So it's a specialized type of therapy, but very effective and very good. Platelets can get low, even to the point of needing transfusions in some people. The major risk factors being age greater than 70, presence of bone metastases, poor kidney function going in. But um, it's possible that any of the blood counts can be temporarily depressed. It doesn't mean you're getting some horrible bone marrow disease. It just means it's temporarily down and go back up again. New directions I'm not going to talk about because Dr. Bodai is giving a whole talk about that. OK, the next molecular target I want to talk about is uh, what we call mTOR. I don't know if any of you have heard of mTOR, but mTOR is an enzyme inside cancer cells which has a remarkable history. This is a slide of statues of warriors that are standing in the middle of Easter Island, the big island known as Rapa Nui, in the middle of nowhere in the Pacific. It's one of the most isolated places in the world. And sitting here on the grass are these things that probably weigh 120 tons. They're probably 100 feet high. And they've been there for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years and never blown away in the big storms. And nobody knows how they got stood up there out of a solid piece of stone and how the ancient engineers did it, but they clearly had some pretty sophisticated engineering in this island. So somebody went to look at these stones, whatever, and while he was there, he got this brilliant idea. Why don't I take some dirt from the Easter Islands back to America and analyze it, and maybe in this dirt there will be a fungus that's making an antibiotic, and maybe that antibiotic will be something that's never been discovered before, and it'll hit the jackpot like streptomycin coming from streptomyces. Okay, what are the chances of this happening? This is like Unbelievable, right? People have looked everywhere in China and Africa and America, and all over the world, looking for antibiotics coming from microorganisms. But who would think that there would be something special? Well, believe it or not, he hit the jackpot. They found a fungus that had never been discovered in the world. And this made an antibiotic that was never discovered in the world. So they named the antibiotic rapamycin, because the island is Rapa Nui Island, so they call it rapamycin. It turned out it not only killed microorganisms like fungi, but it also turned out that it had anti-cancer properties. At that time, they were taking every molecule that anybody ever discovered and doing these large-scale tests, of just testing every random molecule that ever happened to see if it had anti-cancer properties in the laboratory. The NIH was funding this. It was a time when the NIH had lots of money. <laughs> okay, so they discovered that just out of, for no real scientific reason that this stuff had anti-cancer properties. And then they started researching what happened. So it turned out this enzyme that was being inhibited, they didn't have a clue what it was. So they called it mTOR. That means mammalian target of rapamycin. So it sounds really scientific when you don't know what you're talking about to say, well, what is, an M what is uh, rapamycin? It's an mTOR inhibitor. And what does it do? It inhibits mTOR, you see. So people started studying this, and they realized that mTOR was a central regulator of cell growth, metabolism, determined how long the cells live, when they die, whatever, and that neuroendocrine cancers have all kinds of mutations that have a big defect in this mTOR pathway so that they have lots of mTOR. And by inhibiting the mTOR, you preferentially will inhibit the growth of neuroendocrine cells compared to other cells. So based on all of this, and based on the fact that some people that have congenital deficiencies, sorry, increases in um, mTOR, get pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors spontaneously, 
The study was done comparing Everolimus. Everolimus is almost the same as rapamycin. Rapamycin is serolimus, and when Novartis made a user-friendly pill out of it, they called it Everolimus. Okay, it's a natural substance. It's not a normal chemotherapy. They did a, a randomized trial. We did this with patients along with a sort of worldwide consortium of cancer centers because it's a rare disease. Um, it was the largest study ever done in pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. 410 patients were randomly assigned to placebo with the understanding they will get Everolimus if the cancer grows, and the other people got Everolimus. The difference between the two groups was astounding, and uh, you could see the top line is Everolimus. The average cancer control time was 14.4 months versus 5.4 with placebo. It's not as long as we see with PRRT, it's not as long as we see in somebody who's never been treated before who gets lanreotide, but it's a major advance in the field, and we're now working on ways of making it even better. Most people who got Everolimus had some tumor shrinkage. The blue and the yellow represent lines, with every line representing a patient. So there are 410 vertical lines. Every line that goes up is cancer growing. Zero is the baseline size of the tumor, and every line going down is cancer shrinking. Okay, so most people had some degree of shrinkage even though the majority didn't have a major shrink. The reason there are some patients at the end there who have a shrink on placebo is because the placebo people were allowed to have octreotide at the same time. Okay, the same study was done, slight modifications in design, but for people with lung carcinoids and people with other types of intestinal carcinoids to see if it would work in these situations as well as in the pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, turns out the curves are almost superimposable and it works on all types of neuroendocrine tumors. So that's a uh, wonderful drug. The next uh, molecular target that I'd like to speak about is the blood vessels in the tumor. This is a picture of blood vessels in a tumor. They look really weird. It doesn't look anything like blood vessels in the rest of the body look more like blood vessels in a placenta. I mean, they're just really unusual blood vessels. And these blood vessels are essential for providing nutrition um, and delivering oxygen to cancer cells. And there are drugs that have been discovered that actually can de prevent the uh, development of these blood vessels and can shrink tumors based on attacking the blood vessels supplying the tumor rather than attacking the tumor itself. Okay? So this gives us a new class of drugs. Sunitinib is a pill that attacks the so-called vascular endothelial growth factor receptor and some other things that stop the blood vessels from growing in the tumor. It, it turned out that in pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, it was highly effective. Progression-free survival, which means how long patients can go with no sign of cancer um, growing, was 11.4 months. It's uh, just virtually identical to what we saw with Everolimus. Works completely differently, but it's another type of pill it is effective. It's most effective in pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. Cabozantinib is one that has similar anti-angiogenic properties. It also attacks another molecular target that we call CMET. And this particular drug has turned out to be extremely effective in um, neuroendocrine tumors um, of carcinoid type, as well as ones that are pancreatic. This was a study done by Dr. Jennifer Chan at um, Dana-Farber, and it does look like it's quite active. Progression-free survival is long, 21 plus months, and based on that, a randomized trial is being done that we're doing right now in conjunction with her group, comparing cabozantinib and placebo to determine the place that this has. Chemotherapy has always had a bad name for neuroendocrine tumors because it doesn't work and it causes a lot of side effects. The major exception has been people that have really, really aggressive neuroendocrine tumors, high-grade neuroendocrine tumors, like small cell undifferentiated neuroendocrine carcinoma of the lung or other types of high-grade neuroendocrine tumors. It's very effective. It doesn't cure the cancer in most cases, but it can sure shrink it up fast. But in most neuroendocrine tumors that we see, the so-called well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumors, carcinoids, doesn't work so well. There was one drug that came out years ago called streptozosin. It's actually approved for pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, but not used so much these days because of the kidney toxicity associated with it. But there's a pill combination called temozolomide, which is one type of pill, and capecitabine, which is another. These go by the brand name of Temidor and Zolota. 
XELODA, we call the temozolomide capecitabine. It's usually abbreviated nowadays by the nickname CAPE-TEM, capecitabine temozolomide. Okay, the capecitabine is given every day for two weeks, twice a day, morning and night. The temozolomide is given every day consecutively for five days, on days 10 through 14 of each of these cycles, and then the whole cycle repeats every month. It's a, it's a way that seems to be uh, maximizing the synergy of the two drugs. The, the amazing thing about this is the objective response rate, the percent of patients who have a major shrinkage of cancer, shrinkage defined by 30% shrinkage or more, okay, happened in a third of the patients. That's enormous. Remember with PRRT, which is you know, so active and nukes the cancer cells, we have a 19% response rate. Here we have a 33% response rate. So if somebody with a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor, borderline resectable, you can't take it out, but you really want to, if you can just shrink it away a little bit from blood vessels, you have a one in three chance that you'll shrink it up so much that you might be able to have surgery. And maybe some of the other people, even less than that, um, would be enough to go from inoperable to operable. So there are certain selected cases where this is really a wonderful treatment, and it provides another treatment for pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. Progression-free survival with that was over 22 months based on uh, the study. Now, another drug I wanted to talk to you a little bit about is Telotrostat, which goes by a brand named Zermelo. This is a drug which blocks the production of serotonin. There's an enzyme we call tryptophan hydroxylase that turns the, en the amino acid we eat in our diet, tryptophan, it turns it into um, the precursor of serotonin that makes serotonin. If you block this enzyme, you stop production of serotonin, and you can drop your production of serotonin by neuroendocrine cells by 50% over what is possible with uh, somatostatin analogs. So you treat with a somatostatin analog, your serotonin, let's say, goes from 1,000 to 500. You treat with this drug, it might go from 500 down to around 250, 300. It drops it down tremendously, and along with that, it tremendously improves diarrhea. So there's really a lot that could be done now when people have carcinoid syndrome diarrhea. Not only can we treat with somatostatin analogs, but we can use telotrostat as well. There's a hope that this will help prevent carcinoid heart disease, which is one of the uh, big complications of having a um, high serotonin level. You can cause scarring in the heart. That hasn't been proven yet, but it would make sense that low serotonin would be a good thing to do and would make that less common. It's a pill three times a day. Most people tolerate it well. And as I mentioned earlier, the other major means of treating carcinoid syndrome is to get rid of cancer by any means possible, which can include surgically removing metastases. It can mean embolization of the liver in various ways. It can mean, uh, you'll hear about these things in more detail later. It can mean ablation of tumors, all different things. But you want to get rid of cancers that won't make so much serotonin, and then you want to treat the serotonin that's being produced. It's important to mention that this particular anti-serotonin drug does not cross the membrane that separates the blood vessels in the brain from the actual brain. So it does not get into the central nervous system. This is very important because if you reduce serotonin in the brain by 50%, you might stop your diarrhea and then get so depressed you'll be jumping off a bridge somewhere, and that wouldn't be good. So it does not seem to have a major effect on depression or mood. It does have a big effect on production of serotonin in the body. There's a drug, I don't know if you want to call it a drug, you might call it a nutritional supplement called Enterade. It's a mixture of five amino acids, valine, aspartic acid, serine, threonine, and tyrosine. These are just all normal amino acids that build, are the building blocks of your proteins. Mixed with some um, you know, generally accepted and tolerated sweeteners uh, made by the same folks that make Gatorade, basically but it's called Enterade. It's made specifically so that all the nutrients are absorbed by the small bowel. There are people who have trouble maintaining nutrition because they have diarrhea all day and they can't absorb the food they're eating. But every amino acid that you eat in this mixture gets absorbed in the small intestine and you don't poop it out. It also seems to reduce diarrhea. An early study shows that that's the case with um, carcinoid tumors, a study that was done at University of Kentucky. So we're trying to make a, a large study to try to conclusively prove this and figure out how Enterade might figure into the treatment of carcinoid syndrome. But it's certainly uh, quite non-toxic and quite exciting. 
and natural. So these are the things that we talked about, kind of summarized. There are a few drugs also that are anti-diarrhea treatments and things that can slow the release of hormones like a blast of steroids, but um, these are the main things. Very important is when people have surgery, they should be aware that anesthesia is one of the things that can trigger a carcinoid crisis, which is a big problem. And we normally treat that with lots of somatostatin analogs and other medications. The exact uh, treatment, the exact role of different somatostatin analogs is being hotly discussed. Um, most people feel it's a good idea to use lots of somatostatin analogs before surgery and use an octreotide drip if you uh, need to. Um, there is a surgeon in Oregon who's a very prominent uh, person in the field, Rod Pamier, who feels that that doesn't help but most of the world is still using it and doesn't want to take the chance of a, a massive drop in blood pressure happening in the operating room. But I think as time goes on, we'll sort out the optimum management of carcinoid crisis. So in conclusion now, we have several options for treating metastatic neuroendocrine tumors. We have somatostatin analogs, which are used instead of somatostatin since they have a much longer half-life in the body an injection either a couple of times a day or once every four weeks, depending on the kind, whereas natural somatostatin only works for a few minutes. So we have somatostatin analogs. We have everolimus, the mTOR inhibitor. We have interferon. We have PRRT. We have telotrostat for carcinoid syndrome. There are a few people where the cancer has never grown for the last 10 years, and they have only little teeny spots, and they come to see you and say, well, do I really need anything? My cancer hasn't grown in 10 years and all I have are little teeny spots. So maybe those people can be monitored. It's actually a very small percentage of people who would be appropriate to monitor without doing anything, but there are a few people like that that don't need treatment right now. And of course, clinical trials, which are how we are, have gotten where we are today, is uh, all the things that we're talking about were clinical trials just two, three, four, or five years ago. Most of these clinical trials have been very recently done so, and we have things that are very exciting. Like you heard, we have um, capazantinib, the new type of um, anti-angiogenic uh, cement inhibitor. We have trials that hopefully will be starting with the Enterade. We have trials with a new kind of drug to overcome resistance of Everolimus that um, Elise mentioned in her introduction was something that uh, NetRF is interested in. We have a big randomized trial about to happen for people with pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors that are resistant to Everolimus. We have new things happening, as you heard, with PRRT, which, um, and so there are just many, many things that are called clinical trials, but the chances of major success from many of these things is high. Pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, we have pretty much the same with the addition of sunitinib and chemotherapy, okay? So how do we decide what we do when? Okay, that's why we have our multidisciplinary tumor board, but I'm just gonna give you an idea of the kinds of thoughts that go through people's heads when they sit around a table uh, talking to each other, okay? The extent of the tumor, is it localized to where it started? Or is it spread, in other words, is it operable for cure or is it inoperable for cure? Anything that's operable for cure and the patient is an operative candidate, there isn't even a question. Surgery is the treatment of choice. It's the only treatment that you can use to cure it. Anybody who can get operated on gets an operation for curing a cancer. Okay, the next thing is the site of metastasis. Neuroendocrine tumors that start in the pancreas and intestine preferentially go to the liver when they metastasize. The tumor cells go into the blood supply that leaves the pancreas and leaves the intestine, which is called the portal vein. And that vein goes directly to the liver to filter the blood. So it's a bypass tract that takes the tumor to the liver. So the liver gets a big dump of cancer cells before the rest of the body. And these cells can take root. And that's why you see people with neuroendocrine cancers sometimes that have 20, 30, 40 liver metastases and don't have much else in their whole body. If you have metastatic breast cancer with 20 tumors in the liver, you'll probably have an equal number in your lungs and bone and who knows what. But here it goes just to liver. Okay, so if liver dominant, it doesn't mean liver only, but liver dominant metastasis versus not liver dominant metastasis. Because if you have liver dominant metastasis, you can do things to the liver. 
You can use bland embolization, chemo embolization. We have a clinical trial that hopefully will start soon, randomizing people between bland and chemo embolization to see which is going to be the best. There are two different ways of doing that. You'll be hearing more about embolization later. I'll talk by Dr. Nolkowski. Um, you can ablate tumors with microwaves, radiofrequency ablation, microwave ablation. You can poke a needle into the tumor and fry it. You can have surgeons like Dr. Schwartz, who's going to be speaking later, take them out, which is a good thing to do. If you can remove most of the tumors, you can have maybe the amount of cancer you had 10 years before. You can get a whole, you kind of reset the clock and not have so much cancer in your body. And that's something you think about if it's liver dominant. On the other hand, if you have cancer all over your body and it's growing in all your organs, and it's growing every place, you can't even think about this type of stuff. You have to think about treating the whole body with BRRT, with everolemus, with other things. So the, the individual decisions have to be made. Okay? Uh, pathology is very important. Well differentiated versus poorly differentiated. The pathology of neuroendocrine tumors is kind of complicated, but the bottom line is we call tumors well differentiated if they're grade one or grade two, meaning that they don't divide very fast. Not related to stage, it's related to how fast they grow. Grade one grows the most slowly, less than two percent of less than three percent of the cells are dividing. Grade two, between three and twenty percent of the cells are dividing. High grade, more than twenty percent. And now we're appreciating that grade three is a mixed bag. If somebody has a 25, 30, 40 percent of the cells dividing, that's a different disease than if 95 percent of the cells are dividing. Treatments are completely different. Really, really fast, you treat with chemotherapy. Ones that are like a little bit fast, but not so bad, you can treat just like they're grade one or grade two. So we have that differentiation. I have another item there called pace of growth. But another word for this is you should use your head. If you have a tumor, <clears throat> doctor tells you it's grade one on a biopsy, read by a good pathologist, and he says grade one. And the cancer has doubled in size in three months. That's not grade one. That's a cancer which is growing pretty fast. If you have a mass that's this big and it becomes this big. That's not something that is slow growing. The reason that we see this type of thing is a biopsy is just a little speck. If you do a endoscopic ultrasound of a pancreas and do a fine needle aspiration and you say, now I have a diagnosis of a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor, okay, that's being based on a few cells you suck into a needle. But meanwhile, there's a whole tumor mass. And some areas in that mass might be actually pretty high grade and you might not even know it. So you have to use your head. And if cells are growing fast and you have a biopsy that's low, you have to say, let's reread the pathology. Let's get another biopsy. Let's do something. Let's change treatment. We can't just sit there and watch it grow just because the biopsy said it's not growing, because it is growing. Okay? So <clears throat> doctors and patients need to be aware of that, that even though we think of pathology as the last word, it's not. Pathology needs to be read by experienced neuroendocrine pathologists because a lot of people don't even know what they're talking about. And then even if you do know what you're talking about, it's a sampling problem because these tumors are heterogeneous. Okay? Next thing is the primary site. Pancreas versus not pancreas. It's actually, there's more to it than that because all different sites are different. Rectum is different than small intestine, and small intestine is different than stomach. But I'm just telling you in general terms, if the tumor starts in the pancreas, it's uniquely sensitive to chemotherapy and can respond more rapidly to other things. And there's some special features like that. But certainly you want to identify the primary site if you can. In many cases, there's no known site. It's called unknown primary. We've done studies trying to figure out what the unknown primary really is. Most of the time, it's small intestine and hasn't been appreciated. You can pick them up on gallium 68 dotatate PET. You can pick them up on endoscopic procedures like double balloon push enteroscopy that Dr. Kim can talk about. <coughs> so most of the time, you can actually find them. There are a few cases we never do know where it came from, but just be aware that unknown primary doesn't mean always unknown. Um, next thing that's super important is does the cancer make hormones or does it not make hormones? The ones that make hormones are called functional tumors. In the case of intestinal carcinoid tumors, the major hormone they make is serotonin that we measure when we make a serotonin. They make lots and lots of stuff we don't bother measuring. So you can have a normal serotonin and flush all day because the flushing doesn't have to be caused by serotonin. It's caused by other things. But it means the cancer is making hormones causing a syndrome. There are other ones that are non-functional. There's no syndrome. And the ones that are non-functional, paradoxically, can make a hormone sometimes. 
You could have an intestinal carcinoid and have a little bit of gastrin, a little bit of VIP, or this or that. It doesn't matter. Those are just things that happen to be made. But if you're not having a severe syndrome, like severe low blood sugar from too much insulin, severe diarrhea from too much VIP, it doesn't count as a functional tumor. So again, it has to be interpreted according to the patient and according to the lab, but not by laboratory alone. Symptomatic tumor in bulk, uh, mass-related symptoms versus no mass-related symptoms. If you have a tumor which is blocking your intestine, which is blocking the tubes coming out of your kidneys, which is causing serious problems because of the size of the tumor, it's to your advantage to shrink that up fast. If this is a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor, you might use capecitabine temozolomide right off the bat and not wait until it progresses on lanreotide first. You might just throw it all at the tumor. You see, it might make a difference if somebody goes to surgery sooner versus later, but if somebody has major symptoms secondary to hormone production or major symptoms secondary to tumor mass, you got to do something about it. Always considering what are the risks and what are the benefits of each treatment, what are the goals of treatment, and figuring out what the best recommendations are at the same time and discussing with a patient what's going on. That ends my formal remarks. I really appreciate the great opportunity to speak with you people.